All right. All right, now everybody has to be really careful what they say and do. So if you're running for office, send me an email afterwards and I will not publish this video. Okay, so uh, today is going to be a little bit different than what we've done in the past with some of the sessions we've had recently because there's going to be a lot more interaction with the Teams app. This is a power user webinar, so I, it's really important that we show you how to do these things inside of Teams as well as tell you kind of, you know, where it came from and how it came about. So uh, if you were expecting just to sit back and watch a movie, sorry, that's not what you're going to get today. Not at all. Here's a little bit of information for those of you that are new to us about, uh, about us here in Atlanta at Decision Digital. Uh, we're a managed service provider that does, uh, manages networks for people all over the world. It's kind of cool to be able to say that. Uh, but we also have expertise in doing uh, implementation, rollouts, workflows, and other types of methodologies. And one of the things that we feel like we're really particularly good at is teaching people about using some of the technology that they've invested in over the years. Uh, today, we have a really nice group of people that are joining us. Uh, some of you are end customers that we do business with directly. Some of you are peer partners, other companies that are in the managed services space that do exactly what we do, uh, that we work with uh, together uh, for the greater good of sharing ideas and thoughts and, and information. Uh, we're glad to have our, uh, those folks here. We've also got some partners uh, that have joined the call as well. Uh, you'll see uh, one of the, a couple of people that are going to be at you. You'll see some folks from Brightgage that are floating around on here today. Uh, you'll also see um, Stefan from Decisions, uh, who is out here as well. I think he may be waving at the moment. Uh, so we've got partners that are here as well. The idea of bringing all these people together really is so not just so you can learn teams uh, for yourselves, but for those of us that are in the managed services space, uh, we have customers that we have to share this information with, that we choose to share this information with. But I think it's also important that different partners and people that do what we do start to hear the questions and comments that come from our customers uh, and that partners can hear those questions as well and be able to field them. Uh, so that's the reason we've kind of brought together this potpourri of people. So uh, with that said, let's talk a little bit about Teams. I want to give you a kind of a real quick uh, timeline of, of kind of how this, uh, this came about. And some of you probably are going to be very pleasantly surprised. Um, you know, Teams was actually created by Microsoft kind of as, a, uh, as an internal challenge project during a hackathon uh, in 2017. Yes, it was actually a challenge that was put to the developers of go create a collaborative tool. They actually bought a collaborative tool back in 2007 uh, that was called Parlano. You probably haven't heard of it. Uh, it wasn't widely used by a lot of people. But the reason that I find it very interesting is that you can see when Microsoft actually got into the chat business back in 07, and it was actually before Slack was released in 2013. As time went by, uh, they continued to kind of add more features and capabilities. They added into Teams in uh, 2018, and then in uh, early 2019, they actually announced that they were on Skype and take the chat features, the video conference features and such, and start to deprecate those in favor of Teams. Now, many of you may be saying to yourself, well, why would they do that? Because they spent a whole lot of money buying Skype a number of years ago. The simple answer is, is that Skype, as good as it is, uh, had limitations in Microsoft's eyes. The video conferencing, the chatting was all really, really good and it could do what they wanted it to do. But the truth is, as I think many of you now know, Microsoft had much higher aspirations for Teams. The idea was, is they wanted to develop a platform where this would kind of be the center of the universe. More than just collaboration, more than just communication, more than just video calls, this would be the place that all different things throughout the Microsoft 365 ecosystem would all start to link together. Now, when they first released it, nobody really had any clue how far and wide this was really going to go, including us in IT. We had no clue. We just thought, oh, this is just Microsoft's answer to Slack. As, as many of you probably have figured out, uh, it's much, much more than that. We're going to show you a little bit more about that here right now. So, if most of you probably have already figured out what the theme of today's session is, right? It seemed very, very fitting. Um, let me pull my Teams window up here so I can show you kind of uh, a couple of things that I think you should see. 
And I will uh, apologize on the front end. If there's anything out here that is uh, not suitable for some of you, then I will just apologize now uh, and let you know. But I'm just going to show you kind of exactly uh, the way it looks. So here, here is my Teams. Can you see that on the screen? Yeah, thumbs up if you can see my Teams. Great. So this is what, uh, this is what Teams looks like. Uh, congratulations. Uh, I'm done for the day. Um, Teams is Teams is actually a, a pretty cool little product. It does a lot of really, really neat things. The basic thing that it does that I think most of you all know is it does basic chatting features, right? All right, well, that's pretty easy to understand. Let me move this out of the way here real quickly so I can do a better job. And I can make this a little bit smaller. There we go. All right. Now, one of the questions that I constantly get uh, about Teams is I don't really understand the difference between the chat window and the Teams. Okay, it's, it's not that hard to understand. Think of it this way. Chats are really meant to be conversations that you're having between yourself and somebody else or yourself and a small group of people, right? That's really what it's meant to be. One-off conversations. Hey, how are you doing? Are you attending Rick Harbour's boring webinar this, you know, this morning? That kind of stuff, right? You can also share files, information, all those kind of things in the window. And it really mimics what most of you are already accustomed to, which is kind of the text format, right? The SMS format. Uh, where teams really start to come into play is where you can start to set up groups of people in order to be able to broadcast information to them uh, on an ongoing basis. For example, you can see here are some of the teams that I actually have set up in our organization. I have you know, a management internal, I have network services, uh, and then I have some other ones that are specific to some of the things uh, that we were doing. The nice thing about creating a, a, a team inside of Teams is that some magical things happen behind the scenes when you do so. If you create a team, it's actually, uh, the lingo gets a little bit confusing inside of, of Microsoft 365. It actually creates a group. And a group is a collection of people. That's all that it is. When you create a group uh, inside of Teams, a team, behind the scenes what Microsoft actually does, which is kind of cool, is it automatically creates a site in SharePoint that's linked directly to that group, which is nice because as you start to upload files, if you start to collaborate, you don't have to do that additional step. In other words, I can create a team, I can start to communicate with the team, and I don't have to go into SharePoint and then create a site that goes with that team so that I have the ability to exchange information and upload files and all that. It does it all by itself, right? Here's what I mean. This is a team that we have internally for all of our network services people, right? Okay, well, this is probably not something that looks highly unusual, but one of the things that it does automatically is it creates this SharePoint site behind the scenes that contains all the information that's going on with the particular group. You see how, that, how nice it is to have that integration? I didn't have to go fumbling through my SharePoint site to find any of the information. It does it automatically for me. It just takes care of that, which I really, really like. So when you want to start working on things as a group, it's really, really good to create first to create a team. Here are all the people that are gonna be involved. And when you do so, you also get the ability for spreadsheets and plans and all those other kinds of things. It makes it easy for you to be able to sign permissions. So instead of having to add people individually to that plan or something else, you can just assign the group, network services or business management, whatever the case may be. So in addition to doing that, what I also like to do is I like to create very specific channels for things that we're working on as a group. The idea behind creating the specific channels is actually pretty simple. If you think about the way that your email works and other things work within your organization, as time goes by, there's a lot of noise that gets generated, right? So we try to keep some of the communications in their own boxes. So you can see I've got a couple of different projects that I'm working on here, 2021 planning, uh, ASR. I try to keep that communication inside of those boxes so that it doesn't fall in the general channel and run the risk of actually getting lost. The other thing that's nice is that anything that relates to that particular item stays with that item. So for example, if I'm looking at my 2021 planning, I can have a spreadsheet, I can have a plan, I can have Word documents, I can have all those pieces that are part of that, that stay in that container. 
So if I'm talking to Alyssa and say, Alyssa, I need you to go take a look at something in the 2021 plan, she's not fumbling around looking through all her old team's message to find that attachment or that file. She goes straight to this particular channel and knows that everything, correspondence and everything is right where it needs to be. Now, different people have different ways of approaching this. I have some people who strictly just pop everything into the general channel, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, I have a lot of people who stack a whole bunch of sub-channels on here. That's fine, too. It's a matter of personal preference. I'm sharing both so that you know exactly what they do. Within your organizations, you're going to decide what the most um, advantageous way is in order to do those kinds of things. So when you build these out, you're going to notice across the top, you're going to see that I have uh, these different links that are up here. Okay, these are tabs. Tabs are pretty cool and pretty easy. Um, the thing about tabs, which is nice, is that some of them are here by default. Uh, wikis are here by default, posts are here by default, files are here by default, right? When I say files, here are files. These are the files that you've uploaded within the chat, within that particular channel. So you don't have to keep scrolling back and looking through all the threads. Hey, where is it that Sam sent me that price list? I know he sent it to me two weeks ago. Where is it? I don't have to go through and do all that. The same is true when you think about email. Right? How many times have all of you gotten an email from somebody that had an attachment that went along with it? And you're like, I know this was sent to me, and I think it was sent to me sometime maybe two weeks ago. And then you do that time-honored tradition, that knuckle-dragging caveman march of going through your inbox or your deleted items or your sent items, trying to find the attachment. I mean, all right, this is a safe place. How many of you have done that? Raise your hands. Sure, we all have. Teams eliminates all that because you don't, if there's a file or an attachment, you just go right here and it shows you any files or attachments that have been included in that particular channel. I love that. It makes me more efficient and more effective at what I do, right? Now, you can also add your own tabs up here, right? Pretty easy to do. You can see here that in this particular, in this particular team, I've got a Microsoft Planner plan, right? Here's a plan that we're working on as a group that we've added in here. Now, how did I get that to drop in? Easy. You just click this button. And then you can pick from any of these programs or tabs that are here. So if you want to add Planner, you can add Planner. If you want to add a document library, you can add a document library. If you want to add a link that goes directly to someplace within SharePoint or another URL, you can add that too. So the idea is, is that when you're collaborating with your team, you're pulling together all the things that they need into one place so that they don't have to click around and look at all these different systems. Now this can exist pretty much anywhere in 365 that you want it to, right? So you can see that adding the tabs across the top, really easy to do. Just click the plus and find it and off you go. If you want to eliminate something from in here, like I don't use the wiki at all, I can remove it. And gone it goes. Pretty simple. So this is how you kind of keep people kind of in a single pane of glass, which I love. Um, creating meetings. Well, creating meetings inside of here is really, really easy to do. You can do it from inside of Outlook if you want. Uh, Outlook meetings are pretty easy to do. If I go to my calendar and I wanted to create a meeting for, let's say here, with Teams, I know. Super simple. Meeting example, you can invite your attendees, dates and times. Now everybody watch really carefully because there's a really complicated step that happens. Are you ready? This is how you create a Teams meeting. Just like that. I know, it's amazing what you can just do with one click of a mouse. And once you do this and you add attendees, you're not gonna see that any, you're gonna say to yourself, wait a minute, nothing happens. Nothing appeared here, nothing appeared there. Once you save this meeting and come back into it, you're going to see that the information that's down here gets populated. It's populated with the link. Uh, if you've gone into the admin tools inside of Teams, it can have your logo for your company. It can have a call-in number if you've got a call plan. It'll add all that information right into here. And then the nice thing that it'll do after that is it'll pop it directly into your calendar. Uh, and when that time actually comes up, it'll come up with a little box that says join. Here's the part that I really like about it. When you create that inside of Outlook, hey, it pops up in here too. 
So you don't have to bounce back and forth between your email calendar and Teams and try to figure out what's where, guess what? It's all right where you want to be. And if it's a Teams meeting, it's going to have a little button that appears here that says join. And it will take you right into Teams, right into that meeting. If you want to create a meeting from inside the calendar here, well, guess what? You can just create a new meeting and it'll do the same thing and it will appear also in Outlook. So you're kind of staying right where you want to be all the time as it relates to that. So it's easy to create meetings. If you want to just do a quick ad hoc meeting, you can click on the button that says meet now. Uh, you can add people into the meeting and everything is groovy and you can move through it pretty nicely. Now, I'm talking about all the great things that are inside of Teams, but let me show you one of the things that is kind of a, a hidden feature that there's a lot of complaints that come to Microsoft about this. Uh, there's commitment from them at some point that they're going to take care of it, but it doesn't happen by default. And I'm sure that when all of you look at the next thing I'm about to show, you're going to be like, oh man, I had no idea that it was here. No wonder I'm not seeing stuff. So how many of you are working inside of your chat windows and know that every time that somebody sends you a, a message, it puts a little bubble over chat that tells you how many messages are there waiting for you? Raise your hand. Good. That happens for me too. Isn't that awesome? Now, um, how many times have some of you set up a team and messages are coming in team, but you don't have any visibility of it? You know, Erin has been sending me messages in Teams and then she sends a chat message that says, are you seeing my messages that are popping up at Teams? Oh my gosh, I haven't been seeing them. Why haven't I been seeing them? Why won't Teams tell me that people are messaging me on the Teams and in the channel side, but it always tells me about stuff coming up on the chat side? Easy. You're just missing a setting. Check it out. See these three dots that are right here? Everybody click on those real quick. And you're going to see all sorts of features, right? Now, if you click on one of your channels, you're going to see a different set of features that come up. One of them that you need to see, channel notifications. So I'm going to tell you everybody right now, go to each one of your channels and go in here and enable this for all activities. It does not turn on by default. I know, it seems kind of silly. But if you don't turn that on, as people are messaging you inside of your Teams, you're simply not going to see the information. It's not going to pop up. But if you enable this, then you can. And if you want, you can customize it. You can tell it what you want to be included. If you don't want to be included in every single reply, then uncheck this box. But this is how you get those notifications. Now you're going to see a bubble pop up here. You'll also see things pop up in the activity window. Now to indicate to you that somebody has updated those channels. Really, really important that you implement that. Something else that a lot of people don't know, does everybody know that when you create a team inside of Teams, that it automatically creates an email address that you can send emails to? How many of you knew that? Okay, those of you who don't, you can come in here at any time and you can just take a look and see uh, what the email address is uh, by choosing the three dots and going to get email address. This is really cool because now if you want to email stuff right into the team, you can. Let me give you a really great example of where that works. So in our network services, see this message right here? Can everybody see this where it says PBX? Yeah, thumbs up. Great. So here's what we did. We have an after hours on call system. People leave messages and it automatically generates an email or a, an email as well as a voicemail message. We've got this set up so that every time that somebody does that, it automatically shoots a message directly into this channel so that the entire network services group can see it. We're not sending it in through email, uh, through conventional email because if you're like me, you get hundreds of emails every single day, and it's become a, you know, a pretty ineffective way of communicating a lot of things, especially emergencies. So what we did is we said every time a message gets received, we want you to send it to this special email address, which is the email address for this channel. So messages now can flow in. If I want to send a message to everybody in network services, <coughs> excuse me, I can just send an email to this email address and it will go to everybody and it will drop inside of Teams instantly. You don't have to set up an email address inside of Exchange. You don't have to do anything else. It auto generates and it's there for you to use every time. I love this because it makes it easy to communicate. It also, gets, it also gives you the ability to easily route things into Teams, which I love. 
So that's what the email address is all about. I love it. You should be taking advantage of it. If there are things that need to funnel to your team on an ongoing basis, I highly recommend you leverage that particular feature. Sometimes you come up with the, with the need that you need to save a message. There's important information in there uh, and you wanna be able to do it. Well, kind of right here inside of the message, you actually have the ability to save it. And when you save it, it actually can bookmark it so that you can go back at any given time and go back through all your bookmark messages, find something that's important. Uh, here's information that's been shared about our retirement plan. Um, here is an important password that's been shared with the group uh, inside. You can tag that really quickly so that you have the ability to go back and find it anytime. While I'm in here, you also see that you have the ability to share something via Outlook. If you wanna take a thread and just email it to somebody, you can do it old school if you want by trying to select everything, copy and paste it. You can do that if you want. Uh, you can take a screenshot if, you, if that's the way that you wish to do it as well and then paste it into the message, or you can just click right here uh, and do it. So you can do it the old way, which is a lot harder, or you can do it the new way. That's how you can save messages. Any questions so far about anything that's popped up? Anybody learned anything yet? Hey Rick, I had a quick question on those saved messages. How do you go back and check them quickly again? When you go to save messages, you'll look up here. Got and it will take you to your saved message. Okay. Yep, that's where it's hiding. That is where it's hiding. Good question to ask. Now I've got this saved message that I'm gonna have no idea why I just saved it, right? I'll go back and say, why did I save this? All right, awesome, let's keep going. Great. So, never thought you would see Slash appear in anything with Star Trek now, did you? No, I didn't think so. So, I call this probably the, the these are the best features that are kind of hidden in plain sight. Uh, slash commands do really, really cool things uh, inside of Teams, uh, especially as you become kind of a power user. You know, here's what I mean. So if I wanted to call Alyssa, for example, I mean, sure, I could go here and then I could find Alyssa's name and I could look at her status and I could do call, right? Or I could just do this and go right to Alyssa, right? Uh, there are all sorts of slash commands <coughs> that are out here that you can quickly and easily get to all sorts of things uh, inside I don't know why mine is not, oh, I know why, because it's not cleared out. If I want to put myself, for example, in do not disturb, I can do this, and it will put me in do not disturb. Or I can go over here and I can click the icon in order to put myself into do not disturb, right? What if I want to know all the, uh, all the commands that are out here for shortcuts and such? Well, I can click that, and it shows me all the shortcuts that work inside of Teams. Well, that's kind of cool, right? Um, there's a whole list uh, of slash commands that you can do. Uh, you can do slash help. And it brings you right out to the help topics for Teams, right? Uh, you can do slash saved, right? And it will go out and get the save list like Brian was just uh, asking the question about. So you've got all these commands that you really just didn't even know uh, exist. Right? Right, type of question. Who is Chris? Right? And it'll start bringing up information. Like for example, it'll show me who somebody is in my organization. If I said, you know, who is Steve? It'll show me this is Steve Miller and it gives me all his information. So I want you to think about what happens in a larger organization. So if you set up an org chart, uh, if you have an org chart set up, then all of a sudden when you type in who, uh, you can find whoever anybody is in a large organization, and many of you work in large organizations, this is huge. Because so many times people are asking the question of, well, who does somebody report to, or what's their extension number, or how do I get a hold of them, or what's their title? Simple. Just use the who command. And what this pulls information from is inside of Active Directory, if you've set up an organization chart, this is a manager, this is people who work in that department, 
Teams gets dialed in and pulls that information so you can find people very quickly and very easily and connect to them. So this eliminates the need to constantly be creating an Excel spreadsheet with all everybody's extensions and all that other information. Why are you going to keep all these different lists for all these different people all the time? Well, I've got my list in Active Directory. I have my list in Excel. I have my list in SharePoint. It's just a lot of work, right? There's just no need for a lot of that. Just don't need to do it. So you can use all these different commands and they will pull up whatever is going on uh, inside of here, which I absolutely love. So, you know, you can go out and you can get a list of all of uh, the slash commands, but these are available anytime. Just hit the slash and it shows you all the ones uh, that are here. Uh, I happen to like this one as well, what's new, because it tells you everything that's what's new. And this one is one that I use all the time. See this slash unread? Remember we were talking about people messaging you from different channels and different chats? It's really cool if you can be just taken to one place that shows you everything that's out there that needs your attention. You can just type in slash unread. Um, the other one that we often use with different users is slash test call. People sometimes are having problems getting teams operating. Well, if you want to have somebody give you help, just do slash test call and it will launch the test call number so that you can go in and take a look. So these are all the different things that are available uh, at any time that you can use uh, as far as slash commands. And they are awesome and really, really powerful. How many of you knew about the slash commands? Ah, my team did, but a lot of the rest of you did not, right? Good. Well, I will tell you by all means, have at it, play around with these. Uh, and use them because they are fantastic and they're really, really, really big time savers. So please go through. Want to chat with somebody? I can just do that and start chatting. It's that easy. It's really, really cool. So that is what, that's how Slash works, right? You never knew that Slash was inside of Teams, did you? He's right there. Definitely. All right. Now, Another area that's really, really fun, external applications. So I'm gonna divide this up kind of into, into two sections, right? There are some embedded external applications uh, that are inside of Teams natively. For instance, you can type in at places or you can type in at YouTube. Okay, those are kind of cool, right? Look, I can come up here and I can type in at places and it'll allow me to gather information about you know, a place. I can say that I want to have, you know, you know, lunch, you know, in Sandy Springs, for example, and I can find a location for us to meet at for lunch, right? And the cool thing is, is that inside the chat window, I can actually uh, come in here and just immediately put it right in here. So if I wanted to have a place to go to lunch, I could just... Um, I could just come in here and I could choose a place and it will automatically pop them up right inside of here. Same thing for YouTube. If I wanted to come in here and do something to find, uh, well, let's just go in. Uh, if I wanted to find a certain video inside of YouTube, I could just search right here, you know, for a YouTube video. Type in the name and it would browse YouTube, you know. Cats playing. All of a sudden I have all sorts of choices, right? Okay. I don't know that Rob wants me to send him a video about cats playing at the moment. He probably doesn't. Um, so those are really kind of cool things that are embedded that are, that are external apps. And listen, Microsoft continues to add um, apps into here constantly. Uh, there are all sorts of ones that are available, uh, but you know the thing that I really, really like the most about some of these external apps are actually not the ones that are baked directly in. I like the ones that are being developed by other third-party vendors that plug in. A really good example of that would be you know, Zoom, for example. I know it seems kind of funny that you have a Zoom app that's inside of Teams, right? Why would you need that? Well, the simple matter is, is that not all the features are there at this point between Teams and Zoom. I use both of them we're using Zoom right now. If I wanted to schedule something in Zoom, if I wanted to schedule a meeting in Zoom, I can do it from in Teams, really without any, without any issue at all. One of the other things that I really, really love is this app that's called Decisions. 
So I could, I could probably speak all day long just about this particular app, right? Uh, Decisions is super, super cool uh, because it allows me to create agendas to be followed in meetings. Now, I want everybody just to think about the importance of that really, really quickly. We all have meetings all the time. We're all running meetings all the time with different people, right? Um, Wouldn't it be cool if inside of Teams, you could actually just create an agenda for a meeting and have everybody adhere to it? Okay, well, that's cool. Now, what if you could create the agenda and actually publish it right inside of Teams without having to generate a document in Word or Excel and then share it out to everybody? Okay. That's kind of cool too. Wouldn't it be cool if you could go into each of the agenda items and assign a specific person to be responsible for those particular items and to notify them uh, that they're responsible for those items, right? Am I getting anybody's attention? That probably sounds pretty cool too now, doesn't it, right? Now, here's the fun part. Wouldn't it be great if I did all that and I could actually spell out exactly how much time that person has to talk? and then turn their mic off when they're done. No, I'm just kidding. But show them exactly how much time they have and the items that they need to prepare. That's what Decisions does. It's a plug-in app that works inside of Teams, as you see here, and it allows me, when we have meetings and such to schedule, it allows me to set up an agenda for my team. So check it out. Here, are we have a weekly meeting at 9 o'clock Eastern time with, with my management team. So this is a meeting that's been set up inside of Teams, right? Here is the agenda for that meeting. This is the one that actually was for last week, right? So this agenda is seen by everybody in the group, right? I can see all the people that are attending, and I can see guests that have been invited here as well. Uh, I can join the meeting right away here in Teams, so there's nice tight integration. Now check it out. You can see here that I have a list of all these items that people are supposed to do, the amount of time that they have to talk about it. So from 9.05 for 10 minutes, we've got a financial recap. You kind of get the idea. And people are assigned, as you can see on the right-hand side, to each one of these agenda items. Let me tell you why this is super, super important. See, when people have meetings most of the time, uh, the conversation gets carried into rabbit holes. People kind of lose focus on the ball, and then you run over. And it's not that these things are not important, but the idea is is that you you start to have to force yourself to focus on the things that are important at the moment and the things that can be shared with the team either before or after that they can look at on their own time. Let's keep meetings moving forward and let's keep people focused on the things that should be talked about, right? Now, if you want, you can schedule tasks right here that go into your calendar that are driven by items in the meeting. So if I want a partnership update and I wanna create a task, I can create a task right here and it will drop into Outlook for you. I love that. Uh, The other things that I love, oh man, I mean, check it out. Whenever you create a meeting inside of Decisions, it automatically creates a SharePoint site to go along with it behind the scenes. So the notes from the meeting, any files that you've discussed during the meeting that you shared with your group of individuals, they all land in that SharePoint site and they're all kept nice and neat together. I love that because I'm not fumbling around trying to find things, right? Hey, what's that thing that Manny and I were talking about in that last meeting? He shared shared a PowerPoint deck. Wait a minute, let me go look through my emails and see where that thing was. No, wait a minute, it was in the agenda. All I have to do is just go right out to the SharePoint site and I can get to it and it's all exactly right where it needs to be. I love that tight integration. That's really where we want to be with all the stuff that we're doing, right? So. If you don't like this view of it, hey, it's not a problem. You know what? Let's go out to the website. And I can get a website version of the meeting too. So it takes a second and then it'll pop up. Hey, it's all right here where I want it to be. Tightly integrated. I really, really like that. And if I want to go back and forth, I can. But the idea here is is that it gives you the ability to quickly convey all the agenda items that are out there for people to do. And it is loaded, I mean loaded, with all sorts of features and capabilities. Great example. You finish up having a meeting with your folks and people want copy of the agenda notes. Some people will go out to the website in SharePoint and grab them, but others may want a copy that's emailed to them. No problem. You can create, you can actually print out the agenda or you can take the meeting notes 
and you can immediately convert them over and have them emailed over to the user if that's what you want, all from right here. You make a change to uh, the syllabus, or I should say the agenda for the meeting, no problem. You don't have to go through Outlook and email everybody. You can simply come in here and you can notify all the attendees of exactly what's happened. Hey, go check out, or I've added this information on to the meeting, by all means, go do it. If you've got a recurring meeting like we have every week, that's got pretty much the same agenda, great. You can take your agenda and you can save it as a template. So that when you create the meeting, you can automatically choose from an agenda that's already been saved as a template and not have to redo these things over and over and over again. You can even come in here and add in polling and decisions for people to make. Uh, we're gonna paint the office, do you want purple or do you want pink? Please select from here, you know, everybody vote yes or no and weigh in. This all happens from inside the decisions app that's plugged directly into Teams. I mean, it is, it's pretty amazing. Out of all the apps that are out there that I've seen inside of Teams, it is by far the coolest and the best one that is out there. So when we're done, I can give you a link uh, where you can go in uh, and, uh, and you can sign up for, uh, for decisions. Uh, Stefan is on the call today. If you've got a, a specific questions about how it works, by all means, he can answer that for you as we get a little bit later on. Uh, but there's also some uh, special pricing that we've been able to secure from these guys as well. So uh, I would highly recommend today, when you're done with this session, uh, email us or Alyssa will email you the link. Go out, sign up so that you can get the, the special demo and trial stuff. I would highly recommend starting to use this app immediately. You'll ch it'll change the way that you have meetings uh, for sure. So this is what Decisions is really kind of all about. And I have a little slide. I know that you're gonna be really surprised that I actually have one. This talks about really what Decisions does. So I've kind of showed you about creating an agenda you can prepare your people for the meeting by circulating the agenda to them ahead of time. The moment you create the agenda and press the button, it notifies everybody in the group, which is fantastic, right? It also sets time expectations, which I also love. You can run your meeting. And while you're running your meeting, you can take notes. You can take those notes inside of Microsoft OneNote um, or inside the body of the, of the agenda itself. And once you're done, if you wish to convert them into a Word document and circulate them around, you can. or you can do nothing and it will just automatically save those notes behind the scenes right to that SharePoint website that you can go back to and look at historically whenever you wish because the linkage is all there. And finally, post-meeting tasks. I didn't really focus a lot on this. I, I think I can actually do a webinar entirely on decisions and it's probably something that we'll do in the coming weeks because it's so powerful with what it does. But one of the things that it will do is it will do text recognition of all the meeting minutes, uh, and it can also start to synchronize the tasks that you assign and stuff directly into Microsoft Planner. So you kind of see where I'm going with this. I'm not having to go and create all these things and all these different pieces and all these different systems. It's all coming from Teams. It's all being fed from Teams, and you can see everything from within Teams. That's the idea, is the single pane of glass that you're going to stay in so that you can see everything that's going on. So. What's another cool app that you can integrate? Well, if you don't already know about it, it's Planner. How many of you right now have started to mess around with Planner? Raise your hands. Something you should look at. It's part of your Microsoft stack. It's great. Uh, it's really useful for doing uh, easy plan layouts. It's not meant to be anything like uh, Microsoft Project, uh, but what it does do is it gives you the ability to kind of lay out information uh, and organize it in such a way so that you can actually see what's going on, right? The, the way that it works basically is that you have silos of information that are called buckets. And under buckets, you have tasks. And those tasks can be assigned to individuals that, are, that you've given permission to use, right? This is the tie back between Planner and Teams. See, what happens is, remember when I told you about creating that channel group, right, that team? When you create that team, that team gets permission to the plan that you create in Planner. So you don't have to keep applying permissions to all these different areas. If you create a plan from within here, those permissions actually carry forward. I like using it because it gives me the ability to kind of 
kind of high level dump and organize thoughts, right? So we're doing some, we're doing some uh, changes right now to our website, right? And the changes that we're doing to our website, we wanted to divide up into the sections of our website so we kind of knew what was going on. Okay, well, that was pretty easy. So we created a bucket for each one of the sections of our website, and we've started to assemble all the information that's going to be the changes that are made. I've assembled these, uh, these different changes, and then I've actually been sharing this with the group of people. How? Because this lends under the business development channel. Hey, we're making changes to the website. How many of you do this right now? You're going to make changes to your website and you start sending emails back and forth. I don't like this verbiage or take a look at this spreadsheet or this Word document. These are the changes I'm going to make. And, and then all of a sudden, Gary's working off of one and Cardell's working off of the other. And before you know it, you're making changes to two different documents and nobody's seeing what anybody else is doing. You can keep doing all that if you really want to. I'm going to tell you that you should. not Do something like this. Set up a quick and dirty plan where you start to list out all the changes of things that need to be done, right? And then you share this with your group. And then everybody, if you can pardon the pun, everybody's working off the same sheet of music. It takes 30 seconds to create a plan. It really does. And you can take it a step further by assigning people. And when you assign people, it automatically will task them. That task will appear in Teams. That task will appear in Outlook. They will know exactly what they're supposed to do. And you can also measure people's progress. So for example, you can click on any of these and you can indicate where it is in the process. You can also indicate if there's a due date, a start date, you can create checklists, you can add a, you can add a drink holder, you can do whatever you want, right? Attachments, you name it. I really, really like, I used to do a lot of this type of work inside of Excel. And I would have these really, really big Excel spreadsheets that had tabs and all sorts of other stuff. But guess what happens in Excel? Uh, I can share that with people, but I can't go to each line inside of Excel and say, I want Jeff to work on this. I want Stefan to work on this. I want Frank to work on that because Excel doesn't lend itself to doing that. Microsoft Lists, which is new, does, and you can kind of get a taste for what Microsoft Lists looks like because check it out. Here's the list view of all that stuff. See, board view by bucket, list view by item and you can see who's assigned and where it belongs so the idea here is is that you can collaborate you can organize kind of get your thoughts together uh, and then you can assign people be responsible and i know wait for it it all happens inside of teams right the center of the universe which is where you all want it to be now i happen to like this integration as well because it also pulls in not only the stuff you're working on in planner but it also will pull in any of the to-do lists and tasks that you have, say, in Outlook or in Microsoft to-do. And you can see those lists right here. Three different places it's pulling information together, and it's all in one single pane of glass, right? This is an exercise in efficiency. I don't have to go all over the place and find these things. It just very kindly pulls all of them right together right where they need to be, which is fantastic. So this is the planner integration. How do you put it in? Simple. Just add the app right over here. And then from there, life as you know it changes forever and happiness will prevail. This is the way that it works. So this is how Planner operates. Uh, we're probably going to have a session coming up here on just using Planner. Again, highly recommend if you haven't started to discover Planner, it's in 365. It's part of your subscription. Start using it to lay things out and share it with your group. Move away from doing some of this stuff in Excel. This is much easier. It really is, and it will be more effective. All right. So the last thing I'm going to tell you a little bit about here is a lot of you probably didn't know that Teams can be used as a phone system. This is kind of an up-and-coming feature that's just kind of starting to happen. Um, most of you know that you can have video calls. Most of you know that you can have live events, those kinds of things inside of Teams. And Teams does, a, you know, is almost got feature parity as it sits with Zoom. The place where, where it's probably weakest in comparison to Zoom is on the live event side. You can do live events now inside of Teams very similar to what, you're, what we're doing right now inside of Zoom. 
except it doesn't have the ability yet to handle registration in a real refined way. If you want people to pre-sign up for live events, that's still something that Microsoft is still working on. But the, the scaling and the capacity to do some live events and such, it's actually pretty cool inside the teams the way that they've done it. They're almost there. But this is where kind of, this is where Teams really starts to pull away from Zoom, is in the phone call feature. Now, most of you have been using the video chat or the video conference and the video chat. What many of you don't know is that it's a fully functional PBX. It has IVR, uh, it has routing, it has call groups, all the things that you know and love that are basic fundamental features inside of a PBX. You can do that right now. It's just a simple matter of adding a call plan to your team subscription. And those call plans range in price of about, eh, they go from about $10 up to about $20 per user per month. Uh, you can build trees, you can build routing, all the things that you would do inside of a phone system. Um, I can tell you that if you're not looking at this uh, as a replacement for a phone system, you should. Now, I know a number of you are in the voice over IP space. Uh, I'm not telling you that VoIP is going to go away. I'm telling you that many of you are going to be faced with challenges and questions from your existing customers asking you, well, why can't I use Teams? It seems to be it seems to be less expensive than what I'm using now. And you're gonna to need to be able to draw comparisons between the two systems to be able to say, well, yes, it can do these things or no, it can't do the others. It's not the exact same thing as a PBX, not the way that it sits right now. But I can tell you eight months ago, the number of features from a PBX perspective that were inside of Teams was this big. And in eight months time, they've increased it to this much. Right? There are now native Teams phones that are out there that you can buy from Yealink, Polycom, and others that will communicate natively with Teams. So if you want to have a phone on your desk and link it into the system, you can. If you want to use a soft phone, well, you already know that you can because you guys use it every day when you're doing video and, and audio calls between each other. You can assign a phone number so people can call in uh, over a regular dial-up line just like you do with Zoom calls. That capability is there right now. As time goes by, Microsoft has made a very firm commitment to throw a lot of resources into continuing to add a lot of features and capabilities. Is it going to be an advanced phone system? No way. That's just not going to happen. But I think that many of you in the voice over IP space, especially over the last couple of three years, I think you have found when you've spoken to your customers, a lot of those features a lot of the esoteric features that they felt like they needed for a long, long time in the phone space, they simply don't use anymore. Uh, some people need to have call reporting. Some people need to have ACD. That's not gonna go away inside of Teams. But a lot of the customers that we all service, they need fundamental phone features. They need the ability to have an IVR answering, an auto attendant. They need to be able to route calls based on a digit that's pushed. They need to be able to transfer calls. They need to be able to have a hunt group or a ring group and have things go back to other people when a call is not answered. Those are things that teams will do right now, the way that it is. The thing that they're missing, uh, which Microsoft has already announced is coming, uh, is full SIP phone support. They have not given a date of when this is going to be available, but it's being worked on right now and they've started to make noise about it. For those of you who are non-technical people or non-voice over IP people, what this means is that if you have a phone on your desk that uses voice over IP now, a Grandstream phone or a Yealink phone or a Cisco phone that really subscribes to one of the established SIP standards, at some point in the very near future, you're going to be able to connect that into Teams and use that phone. So that's going to be pretty much a seminal moment in Teams existence for those of you that are in the voice over IP space, because it means that people are no longer going to be bound uh, to sticking with the equipment that they've got. Or moreover, it changes the conversation of, I don't want to move phone systems because if I do, I'm going to have to replace all this gear. You're going to be able to take that off of the table with a lot of these phones because they're going to work natively with it. So it's really up to many of you right now that are in that space to start getting an understanding of what the differences are between the phone system that people are using uh, and what Teams is going to offer and identifying the things that are important because I can assure you of one thing because it's already happening with us. The customers that are using traditional phone systems or even the VoIP systems that are out there now have started to ask us questions. Why shouldn't I be considering this? So it's good that you be ahead of it now so that you understand what those differences are and read Microsoft's roadmap so you kind of know what's coming 
that'll position you best. And it'll also put you in the place to be able to explain to customers. I know you like the idea of keeping everything in one interface. These are the things you're using now that you said are important to you. You have to stay within the system that you're using, right? Those are the things to be aware of. But it's coming. It's absolutely coming. All right. So I wanted to make sure that I left time uh, for question and answer. There's a lot of information that I went through about using this. So uh, I want to uh, open the floor up, uh, Elissa. Uh, I'm not going to turn off my screen sharing in order to see the chat window, so perhaps you can share with me any questions, or if somebody wishes to unmute themselves, they can. So there are no questions as of now, but uh, somebody did mention that Microsoft recently purchased MetaSwitch. Yes, they have. They have. And so the dynamics continue to change. Um, it kind of goes along with what I was just saying on the voice over IP side. Those of you that are in that space uh, need to be readily aware uh, of what Microsoft is doing here. They're throwing an enormous amount of money at Teams uh, beyond a doubt. So be aware, definitely be aware. Anything else out there, Alyssa? I think you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, Aletha Zenz wants to know she's not finding the Teams option in her Outlook appointment calendar. Does she need to load something? Uh, is Teams installed on her machine? And has Teams been permitted to use in her environment? So those would be the reasons why it potentially is not being seen. And I'll say when I do it, I know you use Outlook online. I use the Outlook app directly. And for me, it's not a switch like that. It's, a, it's something I can click on either when I'm looking at my calendar, one of my options, it says new appointment, new meeting, new items, and then right next to it says new Teams meeting. Yep. I also have the option when I'm creating the appointment, it's not a toggle switch like you should, but it's across the top very clearly, a little button that says Teams meeting. Good suggestion. Also, be aware that some of the security options that, that are inside of Teams may be turned up that are preventing somebody from sharing that particular meeting with, um, uh, with somebody outside of the organization. How would, she get some, how would she get her Outlook to allow it? Uh, she, but how would she get it to allow? Uh, it has to be, it has to be, per, well, it depends. It has to be permitted or we need, we would probably need to check and see if Teams has been properly installed onto her machine and integrated and that the permissions that are in the Teams admin area are actually allowing uh, for uh, invites to come through. I do. Hey, Rick, can you hear me? I can. Hey, good morning. Great, great uh, pre presentation, by the way. I have two quick questions. Number one, um, you know, we are in the voice over IP space and what I'm being, what I'm being told and what I'm hearing out there is that more and more of these manufacturers, i.e. Zoltis, uh, Mitel, you know, some of the others are working on integration certifications with teams. So that's one thing. Can you speak a little bit about what you know about that? And then the second quick um, thing is, is, is Tigerpaw thinking about doing anything with, with teams? Mm. Thank you, Gary. Those are both two very good questions. Yes, uh, a lot of the traditional VoIP people have been uh, looking to do native integrations, leveraging the Teams API uh, inside of their products. Um, and it's really, it's really meant to cater to, well, it's, you know, present, you know, company being what it is, um, a lot of that is being done so that there's not a mass exodus away from these voice over IP platforms in favor of using something like Teams. Now, for a small group of people, let's say 10, 20 users and less, uh, uprooting and moving from one system to say another uh, is not a terribly painful or arduous task. When you're talking about 100, 200, 300 users, it's not a quick decision that's made to actually move from one PBX system to another, as most of you know. Um, I think that what, what the likes of Zoltis are doing is they're trying to keep people still in their ecosystem and show them that they actually can integrate these two pieces together and that they don't have to make the switch. Look, there are really, really good things about the systems like Pulsar 360 Zoltis that really people really, really love. And their interface on doing many things is actually preferred by a lot of folks. At the same time, they're having to kind of keep people calm and say, well, I, I really, really love 
the Zoltis soft phone, for example, but I really want to have teams tied into that experience too. I don't want to have to use two different products. Is there a way that you can bring them together so that they're in one interface? And the answer is yes. And I think that you're going to see, there's going to kind of be kind of three groups of people that are going to be out there. I think you're going to have the people that are going to gravitate to teams as their formal PBX solution. I think you're going to see a number of people who are going to do that. Most of that's going to be cost driven, right? I think you're going to see the people that are going to stay with what they've got, but they want that tight integration so that they can stay in the single pane of glass. And I think that's the Zoltus play. And I think it's a great play because they're going to continue to put features and capabilities out there, but they don't, they don't want people to be influenced to move away because of teams. The, the last thing in the world that the Zoltus people really want is somebody saying, well, you know, I could live without that feature and I could just go full teams. No, no, no. Let's just pull them together, right? And then the last group you're going to have are the people that are just going to continue to live in two different worlds, right? The real large scale PBX folks who really need some of the deep capabilities that a lot of these more sophisticated systems have, and they're comfortable working uh, in two systems. Those people, I think you're going to see are going to steadfastly move away from using the actual chatting and communication that's built into those soft phones in favor of using Teams because of the integration into the rest of the Microsoft stack is what I think you're going to see. Now, as far as Tiger Paw is concerned, there's been no conversation uh, directly from them about native integration into Teams. Uh, not that I've been a part of. I know that, that there was a, I shouldn't say there's been no conversation. There was a conversation about six months ago about what would it look like uh, at a very, very high level. Uh, but there hasn't been any, any further conversation about it. I will tell you that partial integration is going to take place between those two products here in about a month. Uh, and this is going to sound like a shameless pitch. Well, it is. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, we've got a bolt-on that works with TigerPod that many of you use, which is called Trek. And one of the things that we're introducing inside of version four, which is in beta right now, is that we have got native integration between TigerPaw and Office 365. In specific, if you create a project inside of TigerPaw, it will synchronize that project directly over into Microsoft Planner. And if you move tasks from one bucket to another in Planner, it sends those changes back to TigerPaw, moves them around as phases inside of TigerPaw. Now you may be asking, how does that relate to what Gary's question is? Well, by virtue of the fact that we've married those two systems together and information that you put into TigerPaw appears in Planner, well, that information in Planner appears inside of Teams. Tasks, plans, all those kind of things. So those of you that are in the TigerPaw universe, let me share something cool with you. Very, very soon, you're going to be able to create a project in TigerPaw that's going to synchronize over to Microsoft Planner. So you'll be able to see that card-based view, which I love, right? It's called Kanban for those of you who are project managers, that bucketed view that shows you a phase and then all the tasks below it, right? You can move things around inside Planner and it will synchronize that stuff back over to TigerPaw. That's cool, right? But now take it one step further. I'm working on a project, say with Cheryl, for example, I create a project and TigerPaw creates a plan. Well, guess what I can do? If I create a group inside of Teams, a team, that is me and Cheryl and say Jeff, right? I can create that team inside of, you know, as a channel. I can start to collaborate with Cheryl. And one of the things that I can do at that point is I can invite Cheryl into that plan, that Tiger Paw plan, and she can follow along with the things that I'm doing. I'm doing a network install with Cheryl. She would like to know where I am in all these different phases. I can run all that from inside of Tiger Paw. And guess what? Cheryl can see it in Microsoft Planner because she loves Planner. And she loves the way that everything kind of fits into those little cards. So we're beta testing it right now. We're planning on releasing it before the end of the year. And once that happens, Planner and TigerPaw communicate, which means that TigerPaw and Teams will communicate. And you can start sharing that stuff with external users and invite them to collaborate on TigerPaw plans all through 365. Does that make sense, Gary? Yeah, thank you very much. Welcome. Two You're more. Welcome. Two more questions for you. The first one is, how does Planner um, compare with Microsoft Lists? Ah, so this is a common question that is popping up a lot uh, with a lot of people. So, so it is massively confusing for people. Um, it's at a high level here. Here's the way that you can kind of think about it. 
Uh, Microsoft Planner is really intended to be a very basic layout of planning of, of tasks and such as you saw that I was doing. That's really what it's meant to be is buckets and tasks that you can share with other people uh, and, and basically tell them that they need to do these kinds of things. Microsoft List is a little bit different. Uh, Microsoft List is actually based, if you, if you were to look behind the curtains, you would see that Microsoft List is actually based on SharePoint lists, where Planner is really not based on anything behind it. It's not related to, to SharePoint at all. So the idea behind Microsoft List is to be able to take something that looks strikingly similar with plants, but the idea is, is to lay something out that's kind of more of a, think of it more like an agenda format. I'll, I'll give you a really, really great example. If you wanted to lay out an event like a, uh, like I, I know all of you are going to just kind of go in the way back machine with me for just a moment. Remember the days when we used to go to, you know, on-site, you know, conventions and, you know, all the things like IT Nation and some of the other things that we all used to do when we would travel to another city. I know it seems like so long ago. And we would attend uh, a conference. Well, conferences lay it out into a series of days with a series of times and events and people that are responsible for them, right? Inside of Planner, you can lay those out as buckets if you want to. But if you think about the best way to lay out the agenda for, say, something like a conference, it really makes much more sense to do it as a list, right? Here are the list of all the things that are going on. Here are the people that are responsible. Here's the time frame they have to do it, the start date, the end date, all those kinds of things. So what you, when you think about list and compare, compare it to plan, they're very, very similar with what they do, but lists have got far more capabilities in terms of being able to assign those things to people, follow up, present the information, those kind of things. Uh, the other thing that list is starting to do, which is not available for everybody, it's available for some people, is that when things are time dependent, you can take a look at that inside of a calendar view. Those are things that right now are not available inside a planner. You can see planner stuff in, in a grid, but you can't see it inside of a calendar. You can't see it as a list where you see people next to it. Now, the exception to that, you kind of saw kind of what Microsoft's baking up here. If you can still see my screen, this is planner stuff that's, the, you know, that's being displayed as a list. This is what lists really kind of looks like, but these lists are administered from actually in the back of SharePoint. So that's probably not a great answer of, of telling you what the differences are. Here's what I think is going to happen. Uh, I think that what Microsoft is going to do is they're going to merge these products together. Uh, I think planner is just going to become nothing more than a view is what I think is going to happen. And I think this is all going to be put under the moniker of Microsoft list because it makes sense to do that. That's really the way that it needs to be. Uh, list just got released within the last month. It's a new product. They're still kind of vet everything out. Uh, but you can see if you take a look at the way that this information is being presented, this is a different way of looking at information than say this is right. This is what List is trying to do. What List is really meant to com compete directly with is there's a pro there are a couple of products that are out there for organizing projects. Asana is one, Reich is one, Monday is one. These are all products that use kind of this spreadsheet table methodology in order to organize information, checklists, agendas, and such like that. That's really what List is supposed to compete against. But I think you're going to see that they're going to be merging these features together relatively soon because it just doesn't make sense to have both products out there. Um, the next question is that, um, is it possible that some admins may block certain applications? For example, one of our, uh, someone on the webinar today is trying to get decisions and can't find it when they search the apps. Is yes. that possible? It is. So there is a really robust Teams administration system. Well, first of all, I'm sorry that they're getting blocked from downloading decisions because it's by far a magical app. Um, and so uh, whoever that is, make sure that we, uh, that we email them the link after the meeting so that they can go and, and get through and get the special pricing. And Stefan and the team at Decisions has been kind enough to set up something very special for us and the people that have attended the webinar. So I wanna make sure that, that, that they can avail themselves of that. But the answer to your question is, is that whoever is in charge of administering Teams in whatever environment this is, there is a Teams admin section and it, there's a specific section under that controls how applications behave 
inside of Teams. So there's basically three sections. There's a section for what are called approved Microsoft apps. There's a section for third party apps. And there's a section for what are called custom apps, right? So when you go to search, what, what a lot of people do is in, inside of those settings, you have the ability to set who's got control to what. By default, when you set up Teams, Microsoft has everything open to everybody. A lot of system admins will go in behind and they'll say, well, well wait a minute. I don't want everybody to do everything. Uh, I'm going to turn off all these apps unless I approve them. So what's probably happened in that organization is it's set that way. And it's a simple matter of working with, we can either work with them or the, uh, the admin can work with them to go into that app, add decisions, maybe add Zoom, add Planner as permissible apps. Uh, and then they'll be available to, uh, to grab from the apps. The other thing that, uh, that an admin can do is they can actually set up, for lack of any of the words, they can set up what's called a policy template inside of Teams. So that when somebody actually logs in or gets into Teams for the first time or logs in at any time afterwards, they can actually control the apps that appear on the left-hand side and really kind of create that user experience that you want. For example, you can see in mine, these apps that are here, people that work in Decision Digital, these are already preset. So when they log into Teams, these automatically appear. They don't have to add anything in on their own. But that's the reason why that's getting blocked is it? it's a security setting. Okay. Any other questions, comments? There is one other question. Uh, when do we recommend using Federation with other teams organizations versus being part of another organization teams, another organization's teams and switching between teams organizations at the top right screen? Yes, so uh, what that person's talking about is there are, there are basically uh, two ways that you can interact with people outside your organization. Uh, way number one is that you can invite somebody in as a guest uh, and they will appear in the chat thread like you would see or, or in the chat sessions uh, like you would see here. For example, if I come into mine, you're going to see in my chat, this particular gentleman that's right here, Mr. Hoyt, um, he works, he's one of our clients. <clears throat> so he appears in my normal chat thread uh, just like a few other customers do. Now. Anybody at Decision Digital will tell you that I am, um, when it comes to uh, protecting connectivity, me, I'm like a rabid dog. I don't really like people to have direct access unless I give them permission to have access. So what a lot of people do, <clears throat> excuse me, is on their end, uh, they will set up a channel inside of Teams and they will invite me uh, to attend as a guest. Um, I'll, you know, for example, uh, Stefan and I have conversations going back and forth. So instead of it being buried inside of all these threads here, there's a separate channel basically that's up here uh, where he and I have the ability to converse. So what it does, and this is kind of the answer to the question is, I like keeping the information that's coming say from Stefan segregated from daily life inside of Decision Digital. It does two things for me. One, at any given moment, I, I get a notification if he posts a message here, I know instantly. But second, it doesn't collude his information with what I'm doing every day inside of the confines of my office. The same happens for him. He's got, you know, he's got an internal facing Teams set up that I don't see, right? And, and I can only imagine. I probably don't want to see it. It's probably this long, right? Um, Trust but, me, Richard, you, you would be bored. So yeah, it's, I'm it's sure. Cool I'm sure. I'm only sharing the interesting stuff with you. <laughs> so you all can see here that I have uh, different federated groups that I'm a part of. Uh, and the reason is because I want to keep that information isolated. So you really have kind of two ways that you can do it. You can set up a channel uh, here that reaches to people in the outside world and it keeps it here at the team's level, or you can have it entirely separated basically into its own room, uh, if you will, here at the top. Uh, I have a tendency to like this uh, because it keeps me focused on the things that I'm supposed to be focused on that are internal and it builds that kind of wall there between the two uh, is really what it does. Stefan, is there something that you have from your experience that you would add into that? No, but I think it's, it is an important topic, right? Uh, this, you know, federation versus sort of what you showed, which is essentially different instances, but where you are invited as a guest or you're on your home tenant and, and collaborate. And um, another 
level of that is obviously private channels where you where you can have guests that are both internal and external and i guess the whole idea is to make sure that both users and the organization understands when they are sharing information and with whom because that's the fear i guess of any at least larger company that people by mistake are sharing confidential information so it's it's all set up to really you know make it easy to use <laughs> at the same time you know make sure that uh, not the wrong information is is sort of shared that's outside. a very very good point i can set up just so everybody knows i can come in here and i can create a new team and the way that our share that our teams is set up is i can have internal users as well as external users and we can communicate and converse uh just like normal uh it i, I want to make sure that i draw attention to to uh what stefan has said the inherent risk that we always have to be aware of is that the ease of use that's been introduced with Microsoft as it relates to Teams, that the, the risk that is there is, is making sure that you're sharing the right information with the right people. Um, I have a tendency to not have these kind of things. I, I don't have a tendency to collude things together. I'm still kind of old school with wanting to have separation and making sure that I'm really sharing information with people that I'm really supposed to share it with uh, and keeping things isolated in different instances up here. Um, but from time, you know, I can tell you that as time goes by, I'm going to see, and I think most of you are going to see as well, your, your channels and your teams are going to become a blend. They're going to be federated because you're going to find that this is going to become, you know, kind of the weapon of choice. I'll, I'll give you a great example. I, I have, um, there's a team that we'll set up uh, inside of here for maybe communicating with people uh, at, at the distribution level, right? That, that will happen all the time. And I think you're going to start seeing more and more instances of that taking place. Any other questions, Alyssa? We're going to have to unmute you. I am unmuted. Nope, no other questions. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yep. All, all right. Well, everyone, I know we've run a little bit long. I hope that you've learned something today. I uh, hope you're more powerful Teams users than you were when you began. <clears throat> Excuse me. There'll be an email that we'll be sending out to everyone to follow up afterwards. There will be links inside for, uh, to get you to decisions uh, in order for you to get that working right away and start messing around with it. There'll be some other information that we'll share with you, a couple of guides. By all means, use these, share them with your users inside of your organizations, share them with your customers. Uh, so that they have something which is nice to work off of. And if you have questions that come up after the fact, you know that we're just a phone call or an email away. Um, I will tell you all that I hope you all stay safe and remain in good health. And we'll tell you that we'll see you next time.